Hi, this is Walford Kaufman, the pastor of Southside Baptist Church in Gaffney, South Carolina. Welcome to our online sermon. This is pre-recorded. This is a sermon I will be preaching at Southside. That's 204 West O'Neill Street in Gaffney, South Carolina on Sunday, February the 21st. Uh, we're having worship service in our Family Life Center. Uh, that's because of uh, social distancing guidelines and all. We welcome you to come be a part of our regular services on Sunday at 10.30 a.m. But I'm pre-recording this and gives you an opportunity to watch this or listen to this on our podcast. And so thank you for joining us today. Go ahead and turn in your scriptures there to 1 John, the third chapter. 1 John, the third chapter. We're going to be looking at verses 16 through 18. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. You know, uh, internet is so interesting. You can find a lot of information, sometimes the information you don't want, but you can get all kind of information very quickly. You know how you sit down there at that keyboard and you just, on the internet, you write the words, love does. Love does. And then right up under, here's all these suggestions where you can go ahead and click that and go to that particular area. But I did that uh, just the other day. Love does. And guess what popped up under there? Love does not boast. Love does not envy. Love does not keep a record. Love does, does not ask why. Those are some pretty good ones. But then it got a little crazy. It continued on. Love does not cost a thing. That's a joke, isn't it? Love does not cost a thing. Love does not stand a chance. <laughs> I don't know why that came up, but I didn't click that one. And love does not hurt. Where did they get that idea that love does not hurt? If you love, I mean those closest to you, it's going to hurt at times. Love does. So it's kind of hard to put a handle on what love is and what does love do. We think about this. We all know that scripture. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. But what about the world? What about you and me? How are we to show this love? How are we to respond in love? How are we to love, uh, live out the love of Christ each and every day? And that's why this scripture kind of gives us a handle on how to do this love. Let's look at this. 1 John, the third chapter, verse 16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Let's pray. Father, this scripture is a type of scripture that slaps us up right side the head. Because, Lord, we're not doing all that we can do. Lord, you have blessed us. Even us in the poorest of situations are still blessed compared to many in this world. Let us give. Let us do. Let us share. Let us be about your work today. In Jesus' name, amen. That scripture, 1 John, the letter there that is being written, is being written to probably second and maybe third generation Christians. This is not the early, early church. This is those that's gotten along in years, and, and some of the early ones have already gone on to be with the Lord, but these are the folks that have been around a while, and they're losing their passion. They're losing their community of love, and that's why our writer here in 1 John is encouraged them to live out this love. Now, if this was written around 100 A.D., what is it like now? What is it like now, generation after generation, century after century? Are we living out this Christ-like love with others? And so the first thing we're going to be looking at is loving your neighbor has to be grounded in the gospel. Has to be grounded in the gospel. I tell you what, anytime I see that word grounded, of course, I'm thinking of electricity. Have you ever had a situation where something was not grounded properly? I remember growing up, the hot water heater and our stove and then the, the sink was kind of close to each other. And we found out the hard way. 
some of that wiring was not wired, grounded properly. If you had your ha uh, hand over in the sink and reached over and touched something on the stove, there's a good chance you got a, a, a nice revelation. You were shocked. Not enough to knock you to the floor, but it sure didn't feel good. And so we found out it was not grounded properly. But trying to love our neighbor, if it's not grounded in the message of Jesus, if it doesn't have a chance unless it's grounded in Jesus, for we all know feelings change. How many of you jump up each and every morning with the greatest of excitement? You're ready to take on the world. Now, if you are, get off those drugs. <laughs> or if you are, we'd like to kind of slap you upside the head. For there are mornings you do want to jump up and be with great excitement. And there's other mornings. See, feelings change. How many of you look at that loved one that you've been with? Ten years. 20 years, maybe 40 years you've been with that one and you look at them. Do you love them the same way you loved them the first day you saw them? No. Truth is, your love probably has grown. Your love has matured. But I will say this, it's most likely changed in some way or another. See, we need to realize with love, feelings change. Also, we realize fads change. Fads, you know, uh, the 50s, we had phone booth stuffing. Now we got young people today don't even know what a phone booth is. And then the 60s, we had that awful drink called Tang. You remember that? That's called the astronauts. I think we're starting to drink that. And then the 70s, we had the mood rings. You know, uh, they would wear those rings, and if their mood changed, the ring color would change. In the 80s, we had the Pac-Man. And then the 90s, we had these digital pets. And then it just keeps on. Fads come and go. Love is not supposed to be like that. Fad of loving, and that's what it's been like. You remember the teenage love? From one week to the next, how it could change. See, not feelings, not fads, but foundation built on Christ's love stays. That foundation built on Christ's love stays. A foundation that has stood the test of time. God's love that works in the darkest of hours. God's love that works in the roughest of storms. God's love for us even when the world turns against us. His love never changes. His love, for God's love to be lived out. And that's right, that's what we're called to do as believers. We are to live out His love that other people can see Jesus through our love. That's a hard job. We can't do it by ourselves. We need God to guide us through this. But what we need to make sure is seeing the opportunities in the ordinary. Seeing the opportunities in the ordinary. I know it was just a parable. But look over there in Luke, Luke the 10th chapter. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan. You've heard so many times before. But you look at that in Luke 10, starting verse 25. Notice this parable, though, starting verse 25, actually comes after Jesus had just commissioned the 72 disciples and other followers to go out two by two and to share the gospel message. Two by two, they were, and he gives them instructions of what to do. Uh, take very few things with you uh, to go in, into a place, and if they turn against you, just dust off your feet and keep on going. You know, those kind of things. And all this, uh, but uh, he's commissioning it. And then here comes this parable. Isn't it kind of strange that it comes at this particular time? And so Jesus is not just telling a story for story's sake. He's telling this parable as a time of instruction for these followers at that time and for us today. And so we see here was this man that's making a trip, a regular old business trip. He's traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho on a road, and there's, there is robbers there. There are people that will hurt you there, and which was normal. That was normal. For that particular road. So see, people are clicking in their head. This is a story, but here's the truth. People did business between those two cities. They traveled down that very dangerous road. So there's, it's, it's fitting in to these people that's hearing it in this time. And so uh, it's normal. And then we see that a priest comes by. And what does he do? Nothing. 
A Levite comes by and you say, what's a Levite? Well, he's like a, let's say this, he's like a deacon in a Southern Baptist church. He's like a leader, an elder in other denominations. He is one of those that's always that, uh, in the church, teaching, leading, giving guidance to a church. But then, what happened with this? The priest? Nothing. The Levite? Nothing. And here comes a Samaritan. He's a reject. He is a reject. He's an outcast, especially in the Jewish eyes. And what does he do? He sees the ordinary. He sees a man that's hurting. And he goes to him. He goes right there to him. And he ministers to him. And so this to teach us now to think about it. As we travel this road of life, this road of life, for us to put our love into action. Look at the normal, everyday ordinary things that we can be involved in to make a difference in somebody's life. So as we're doing these ordinary things, pray with open eyes. Pray for open eyes for you young people, for you children. As you're sitting in a classroom, pray with open eyes and see the girl that what's going on? She doesn't even make eye contact with you. She turns the other way. She is so, is it shy? Or she's been abused? Has she been neglected? And is she hurting? And she won't even make eye contact. Pray with open eyes how you can minister to that young lady or that young man. Pray for the co-worker that used to be always so bubbly and always had a joke and always kidding and all this. And all of a sudden, he's changed. He's going through a time of depression. Pray with open eyes. Pray for the, the neighbor that was always throwing the hand up and willing to come help and do things. And all of a sudden, they're kind of like a recluse. They, they don't get out. Something's happened. Pray with open eyes. And then listen and obey. Listen and obey. Listen to those in need. Sometimes they don't say a word. It's their silence that is telling you they're hurting and you can minister to them. And sometimes they're the ones that come across as a bully. It could be a bully in school. It could be that bully in the workplace. It could be that bully in the neighborhood and all this. And they're loud and they're boisterous and they're pushing themselves on everybody. They're, they're forcing their way on everybody. Listen, what you might find is a person that's in need. There's a person that's hurting deep down. Listen and obey. Listen to God as He directs you. Now, my wife claims I have this. I know I don't. Men, as you're listening to this, watching this, you don't have selective hearing, do you? You know, we hear what we want to hear. Do we do that with God? Do we do that with God? Let Him direct you. Listen and then obey. And then use your hands and feet. Use your hands and feet. As a youth director back in the 70s, we did a lot of this serendipity type Bible studies. And I remember several of these type Bible studies through the years. It suggested that you have warm fuzzies. And some of you are saying, I've never heard of it. Some of you say, oh, I remember that was a long time ago. But those little, I call basically cotton balls. Some of them was different colors. But we would, we would give these out. After a Bible study, we'd give them out to the young people and say, here's your warm fuzzy. You're not to keep this warm fuzzy. You're to share it with somebody else. And so, you know, as they concluded with a time of prayer, they would take those warm fuzzies and give it to somebody else and somebody get one. And, oh, that makes them feel so special. As I look back, that was one of the dumbest things could ever be. Folks don't need warm fuzzies, little tiny cotton balls. What people need is somebody that actually cares. Somebody that puts it into action. Hands and feet going and doing. Love does not just sit there. Love does not just give out warm fuzzies. Love does by getting involved. By getting involved. Now we need to make sure that we put this love of God in action. And to do that, here's the thing you need to do. Decide now to walk toward the mess. Decide now 
to walk toward the mess. You remember the, the Good Samaritan parable? The priest, if you look back in the scripture, it said passed on the other side. The Levite passed on the other side. The Samaritan, the good Samaritan, he did not walk on the other side. He went right to the mess. He walked right to the mess. Now the Samaritan came where the man was. And he didn't pull out his cell phone. You know, pull out his cell phone and start taking a video. Look at that man laying on the ground. Look at the man laying on the ground. I saw a video the other day on TV. It was about a group of friends. They strapped their friend into a grocery cart, a metal grocery cart. And they pushed him over the side of this cliff uh, uh, next to this river. And this guy sunk down. Now these were his friends. It was a joke. But they almost blew it because, see, they spent more time. They pulled out their phones and started videoing him as he went into the water. They were videoing as this cart was going down. And then somebody said, oh, we got to get him out. And then they jumped in and they rescued him. But I tell you what, it was close. See, we live in a day and time, we want to video everything. We want to see everything from a distance. But we don't want to get involved. We need to walk toward the mess. And so people are hurting when they're hurting, they don't want people coming by gawking. They don't want sightseers. They want people to get involved. People need love in the middle of the mess. In the middle of the mess. And sometimes when we're in that middle of the mess, we don't, when we're in the middle of the mess, we, it's hard to figure out everything. It's hard to know what to do. Just the other week, my wife and I were traveling on the interstate. And uh, we were traveling in one direction, and there was a car on the other side of the interstate tried to come over and, and visit with us. I mean, it was kind of frightful to look up and to see the underbelly of a car, all four wheels uh, up in the air as it's almost, almost over that cable that's in the middle of the interstate. When, thank goodness, that back tire caught that that uh, wire and it pulled it and that that vehicle went down the middle of that wire knocking down all those posts and everything but thank goodness that wire kept that car from coming on that side of the interstate which was bound to hit us and really several other cars thank goodness for that but i got pulled over to the side there and i jumped out and a big tractor trailer rig would part behind me and we rushed down there to where the man was and when we got down there, here was a man that had been in that car. And you know what he was doing? He was on his cell phone. But he was running around the car asking the question, what happened? What happened? He didn't even remember what happened. What a shock it was. And what happened was a first responder came up. And he got his bag out and he rushed over there and was trying to get him to calm down, to look in his eyes and see if, you know, what was going on. Tried to see if he needed any help. But this guy, he was, he's the one that caused the mess. And he didn't even know what was going on. When we're trying to calm people down, sometimes they don't see it all. When there are people that need help, they don't know exactly what's going on. But they need us. Right there in the middle of the mess to help them. And so remember today, uh, remember the mess you were in. You might be in the middle of the mess right now. And you need Jesus to come into your heart. You need believers to come beside you and to help you and encourage you. And I invite you today, right now, invite Jesus into your heart. But also allow people to come in and minister to you. But there's a good chance, as I bring a message to probably a lot of good-looking church folks, you know, you're, you're one of those been in church for many years and all this, and all this uh, but you've been there. You've been in the mess, and God brought you out of it. And God probably put people in your life to help you get out of that mess. Now praise Him. Give Him thanks, but don't forget the experience. 
I'm not saying go back and live that life again. You don't want to go back and live that mess that you were used to be in. It could have been alcohol. It could have been drugs. It could have been pornography. It could have been adultery. It could have been uh, gambling. Whatever that sin could have been. You don't want to go back and do that again. But remember what it felt like. Remember what it was like when God came in and changed you? Remember when God put people in your life to help you in the middle of that mess? You've been through it. You've experienced it. Now use that experience to help others. That's right. You know more than I do. That Whatever that sin, whatever that problem was that you've been through, I may not have gone through that. And so God has brought you to this point. Help others in the middle of their mess. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to go to Honduras on a medical mission trip. Now, I'll be honest with you. The only thing I know about medical is putting a Band-Aid on somebody. But why did I go? Another minister and I, we kind of rotated around. Before they could get to see the doctor and then get some medicine that would help them, we had them come into a room and we would share the gospel message. We try to keep it in smaller groups. And we, through interpreter, would share the gospel message, invite them to come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And we sure made sure they knew this, that you didn't have to get saved to get medical help. You know, but we just wanted to present the gospel just in case there was a lost person. But when I was doing it, he would go and kind of serve as a, uh, how can you say it, a bouncer? No, not a bouncer. A little bit of a, a safety, a security and all this. Because when we went into these towns each day that we did this, they would close down the school and let us have the whole school facility. But these are out in little communities, in little towns, villages. And so the children would flock to that place. And so here you are, you had doctors and nurses over here, uh, and you had other folks who were getting the medicine taken care of and getting it all bagged up and all this. So you didn't want a lot of folks wandering around. So you kind of stood at the door and kept the, the ones that didn't need to be in there at that time out, you know, in a nice way and all this. Uh, and there was a, several nurses. The doctor was from Arkansas, and the nurses, uh, most of them had been his nurses or were his nurses that time, and they came and gave their time to minister. But the ladies there, these nurses, they had, from their home church, they, their women's ministry there at the church had made these sewn uh, little uh, cloth-type dolls, beautiful little dolls. I mean, they had been made by them. But, you know, they only made so many. And so what was going on was there would be not enough for each child in these communities, vi villages that we went to. And so uh, they came up with this brilliant idea. They came up with this brilliant idea. We'll take those little dolls and put them in a paper bag. And so when the, the child, along with the parents, came through and the, saw the doctor, got medicine, all this, we'd give them that. And they'd walk out you know, with instructions. Don't open these bags up until you get home. Don't open them up until you get home. Well, I was standing at the door, keeping the other children out. Well, those little girls come out. And then guess what? They're opening that bag before they got to the door. And time they walked out the door, they had that little doll up saying, look, look what I've got. Look what I got. I had to go in and tell these ladies, stop doing that. And they looked at me and said, what? why? You don't have enough. Because you know what? I was heartbroken. I stood there and I watched one of the most precious little girls she didn't have to see the doctor. Her family didn't have to see the doctor. Didn't have to get any medicine. But she had come there to see what was going on. And so she saw child after child walking out of that door with that little doll. And she wanted a little doll. But there wasn't enough for her. And see, I saw that little child walk out that gate of that school ground and turn and start walking up the street to her house. That little precious child had tears flowing down her face. It broke my heart. It broke my heart that that little child couldn't get her doll. That's why I, I, 
I, I'll be honest with you. I, I came to those ladies and said, stop doing that. You're hurting more than you think. I want you to realize this. For God so loved the world that He gave a gift. His Son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to know this. I want you to know this right now. For God so loved the world that He gave His Son who is enough for each and every person on this earth. We don't, it's just not a select group that has Jesus. But we're to take Jesus, those who are believers, and to share Jesus with others. And to share this message. And there's enough of Jesus for the whole world. The whole world that we are to share. I pray right now that you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And you can invite Him into your heart today. Just simply confess your sin and invite Him into your heart. But for you who have Jesus, who have had Jesus in your heart for a long time, have you given Him out? There's enough of Him. Share Him with others. But I want you to realize something. If you look at the parable of the Good Samaritan, verse 37 you know, it's a parable. It's a story. There was a priest, there was a Levite, the Good Samaritan, all this. It's all having to, to teach a person who's asked a question. But in verse 37, uh, here we say, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. That's the one. That's the one that's important. One who had mercy. And then look at that. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And I want you to underline that in your Bible. I want you to highlight that in your Bible because as I'm reading this, that's not a story. That is not a parable. That's not even a suggestion. What we see here, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. That is a command. A command that still holds true today. When we see somebody in need, when we see somebody that's hurting, we are to go and to do likewise. Are you doing that today? I pray that you will have open eyes, open ears, and hands and feet ready to minister. To minister to those that God will put into your path this day, this week, this month, that you will share the gospel message with. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today, I pray for that one that needs You. They are, like that parable, they are that one that's on the side of the road in need. They've been beaten up by the world. They've been beaten up by addictions. They've been beaten up by sin. That today they can find hope and health and strength in You. Lord, let them confess their sin and trust in You today. But Lord, is this parable... And just like we found in 1 John, we are to live this out. When we have abundance, and Lord, we do have abundance, let us share it with others. Let us do what You have instructed us to do, and that's to love on people. Lord, guide us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Now, if you've got any questions, any concerns, please contact me. If you need to know more about accepting Jesus, Lord and Savior, please let me know. If you have accepted Jesus, Lord and your Savior through this sermon, will you let me know? My name is Walford Kaufman, and you can contact me my cell phone number. It's 864-812-0073. That's 812-0073. You can call me or text me. I would love to hear from you. But also... If you'd like to know more about the church, please contact me. Another way is through the email, pastor at gaffneysouthside.com. If you need to know more about how to touch people's lives, how to minister to folks, I'll be glad to help you in that way. But I think God's going to take care of that because, see, He always lays people on our hearts. And so today, I pray that you'll use those difficult times you've had in your life to now minister to others. God brought you through it, and God's going to use you now. May God bless you.